now, so all that, right? Now we talk about the justice of Allah. Like, what about people? How, does, how do people get to know about Allah? Like, you know, what if you're not even born in a Muslim family and so on and so forth, right? All that sort of stuff, right? So how am I supposed to know about Allah or Islam or anything like that? So this is coming under the, what I'm calling unlocking the phone, right? So if I put my finger, right? Putting my finger, it unlocks, right? So that's the thing. So we all have this basic operating system, this basic essence that when we get the true key, it unlocks, right? So now I've given you a worldview. I've given you, you know, who God is. So what would happen is if you take that fingerprint, that knowledge, and you put it against what's already in your heart as the base operating system, there will be light, right? And that is the essence of proof. That is the essence of evidence. That is the main metric, the main comp compass by which you judge is something true or false. Because, look, Prophet Muhammad did lots of miracles, right? Moses and Jesus, peace be upon them all, they did lots of miracles, right? We all believe that. Did I do any miracle? Can I do any miracle? No. Right? So it's not about miracles. Even, did, even though they did the miracles, right, people did not accept. So if you, if you, if you have something that we'll talk about right now, you will not accept. But if you don't have anything, then you will accept. I mean, the human beings will accept. So this is what I'm talking about. So we have this, this yeah. Yeah, what, what would be an example of a miracle that Bob did? Um, OK, one thing I can think of is, for example, splitting the moon splitting the moon in plain eye, right? So he pointed to the moon and it split. Okay? And, but you couldn't see that, right? But there's still a living miracle. So remind me if I forget. There's a living miracle, I'll come to it. Okay, that you and I can examine. Okay, so recognizing truth, right? So we have this human desire of love, right? Knowing our creator, finding our purpose, you know, finding happiness, finding content, finding you know, our soul, right? So we all have that. Some of us may be busy and you know, you know, kind of putting layers on top of it, so we forget about it. But at, you know, at any, any given time, we would be awakened to it, and we have that desire, right? And then when we have that desire and we see revelation from God, the details such as Quran or any other revelation, anything from God, it would basically make sense to it, and the light would be there, right? So there are certain locks in, within ourselves that at times we want to open. Right? And then we test out various messages. And then we see which message would be my own fingerprint. So this could happen by your own soul. You feeling that emptiness, and you may be awakened to it, and you may go and research. It can also happen because you know somebody else who is religious or spiritual, and he or she exposes you to it. Right? Your professors, your colleagues, whatever. You coming to this class. Right? Anything can be a means for you to be exposed to the revelation of God. But this is a problem. So when we are born, when we are born, just like when I buy this phone, okay, if I don't buy it from, um, who should I pick on? Maybe Apple? If I don't buy it on an Apple, I don't have a lot of you know, nasty software on it. It's like clean Google uh, Nexus state. Right? I don't have a lot of apps. It's going to work very fast. It's going to run very fast. If I install an app on it, it will work. Right? When I start installing Edward, Edge, different apps, you know, Facebook, right? and it starts spying on me, right? then, <laughs> then it becomes slow. Right? It starts taking up a space. When it's full, I don't have space for spirituality. I don't have space for the content of God. Right? Or it's slow, it's making me heavy. I'm always like, you know, in this advert and you know, movies and this and that. I don't have time for God. Right? If not, when we are born, we have, you know, we have a very clean heart. Right? Depending on what we put on the heart, it may become like this, like that, or one of these pictures. Right? You definitely don't want it to be that rusty. So either there's ignorance, you just didn't know the message, or there is arrogance. Right? So it's either ignorance or arrogance. What does Satan have? He, did he have any doubt that Allah is the Lord? No. But arrogance. Right? Some people, it's ignorance. So anyways, one way or the other, your, Allah gives, gives everyone an opportunity 
to remove ignorance. And what's remaining behind is either submission or arrogance for everyone. Even if somebody is mentally incapable, he will get that test on the day of judgment. Because of the fairness of Allah, everyone will get the choice. Right? That it will be ignorance is gone. It's either submission or arrogance for everyone. Right? One way or the other. Okay, so how do we recognize truth then? So, for me, the strongest thing is the theology, right? Tell me what your religion, what any religion tells, says about Allah. Right? That is when I started my own quest after university. Okay? Tell me what is your concept about Allah? What is your worldview about, uh, about human beings? Uh, what about evil? How do I understand the evil, which is relative evil, right? Uh, how do I understand justice, wisdom, salvation? Give me your concept, and then you take it to your heart, and then you see if there's a match or a mismatch. That's the most important one. Okay, next thing for us to examine is the preservation of knowledge. Do I have the ability to go back to the original words of God, whichever religion it is, right? Uh, well, okay, let's go in order. So next thing is to examine the, the truthness of Muhammad. The question is, for all of us, is Muhammad a messenger of God or not, right? And each one of us, we believe, will be asked that question in the grave because we came after Muhammad, right? If we were coming before Muhammad, right, in the t so in the time from Jesus to Muhammad, if we were to be born in that time, we won't be asked about Muhammad, right? Because we never got his message. If we were in the time of Moses and Jesus, who do we follow? Jesus, no Jesus, we follow Moses, right? Likewise, so right now, we will all be asked about him. That's my belief. And uh, so it's a, it's a test that you and I have to do, right? And we can test it in various ways, life events, history. Who is a history student here? Right, there you go. Right, so history, right? And then psychological or personality analysis. Was he a liar, right? Was he doing it for fame, money, power, greed, women? Right? You can analyze that. Right? There has to be a motive. Right? When there's a crime, there's a motive. Or was it deluded? Right? Was there some sort of a mental issue there? Or the alternative, was he a messenger of God? Uh, what about his prophecies? Right? So these are some of the things that you can examine as we were talking about the miracle earlier. Now, the living miracle. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, paraphrasing it, that his miracle, the one that will live after him is the book Quran, right? So the book that I was trying to recite, uh, you have translation for it, and then you have all these Arabic copies of it there. Uh, a lot of people are memorizing it, and so on and so forth. So that's the time-tested miracle. And there are meant various ways to test that miracle. Uh, number one, time-tested, right? Preservation, 1,400 plus years is still preserved. You can go back to the originals, like the exact words. Uh, is there any other religious book that is even claiming to be preserved that I, know, I don't know of? Okay, uh, Consistent and free of contradictions. Consistent and free of contradictions. This is very heavy, right? Because God challenges itself in the Quran that if it was a book other than from God, you would find many contradictions in it, right? And how would a man keep a book consistent over a period of 13 years? Right? So as over time, the book was being revealed, how would he keep it consistent if it was a manly thing? Uh, comprehensive. Right? So it gives you an understanding, a rule, a guideline, a framework, a foundation for everything, for spousal relationships, uh, for food and nutrition, for you know, law enforcement, for war, for defense, for peace, uh, so on and so forth, uh, for wealth, for charity, for social welfare. Um, Okay, answers important question. Who am I? Why am I here? Why is there evil? Where am I heading? What is salvation? And things like that. And then on top of it, the linguistic miracles of Quran. <laughs>
right? If I said that, you actually have a chain. How do I know that? Right? So you have a chain that such and such person heard it from this person, who heard it from this person, who heard it from this person, all the way to the companion who directly heard from the Prophet Muhammad. And you have a whole chain of narration. Right? And from an authenticity and validation perspective, each of those individuals in those chains is basically, you know, when he was born, when he died, you know, how credible person he was, what do people think of his memory, and so on and so forth. And has it been narrated from another chain or not? So there's a whole science of people around it. So you can actually test, is this statement, can it be attributed to the prophet or not? Right? And if it can be attributed, what is our level of confidence in that attribution? So for every saying, we don't have the same level of confidence. So we could have 100% you know, confidence, right? 50%, so we have classifications like that as well. So a question was asked, what is Quran? Who wrote Quran? So, um, so basically, Quran is something that Allah, the God, spoke himself. Those words were heard by the, prophet, I mean, the angel Gabriel and then transmitted to the prophet. Angel Gabriel is the one who would bring revelation to all the prophets, including Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Jesus, and so on and so forth. Okay? So when those words were transmitted, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would recite it to his people, and he would have specific people who were tasked and trusted to write down those words, and they would describe it, and they would write it down. Over time, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, those compilations were gathered, verified, tested, and compiled in one book form, as we have it today. So now, the question of what is Islam? So linguistically, Islam means to submit, right? So you saw that we have two choices, two wills of God. One is a universal will that is imposed on everybody, right? And then you have a will for which you have a free will, right? So you can either eat from the tree or not. You can either steal or not steal, right? You can either pray or not pray, so on and so forth. So uh, Islam is to submit to those orders of Allah, right? And from that definition, we consider all prophets to be Muslim because they were submitting to the order that was given to them. Adam was a Muslim because he was following the commands of God. And this submission leads to happiness and safety, and that is in the relation between Islam and the root word of salam, which means peace, right? So when you submit, that's when you get the eternal peace in this world and the hereafter. Amen.